Hello and welcome to the Beach House 34 podcast. I'm your host, Christine Worth. If you're here, you know that I have been covering the Darley Routier trial transcripts from the very beginning. We are now on part two of Darley Routier's testimony, where we hear directly from Darley herself about the night of the crime. If you missed part one, I'll have a link in the show notes for you. Now be advised that if you're watching this on YouTube, some of the images are graphic, so viewer discretion is advised. Let's continue with part two of Darley Routier's testimony. And the jury has now come back into the courtroom, and the court says, all right, let the record reflect that all parties in the trial are present, and the jury is seated. Mr. Douglas and Mr. Mulder, you may both continue. And Mr. Douglas Mulder then continues and says, yes, sir. And the direct examination is resumed. Now, Darley, at times on this 911 tape, are you carrying on a conversation with a 911 operator? Yes, sir. And at times, are you also talking to your husband? Yes, sir. I was talking to at least three people at once. And at times, are you also talking to the police officer after he arrives there? Yes, sir. Okay. And... Do you know whether or not each of these people, of course, the 911 operator has no idea who else is present? No, she is on the phone. Okay, so is it fair to say that at times that it is understandable that each of these people think you are talking to them, even though you may just be talking to one of the three? As chaotic as it was, I definitely think that is a possibility. But if you're talking to Waddell and you are speaking into the phone and the communications operator doesn't know but what you are talking to her, yeah, whatever she would be hearing. Okay, likewise, if you answer your husband and you are still talking into the phone, she would have reason to believe that, oh, that I was talking to her? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. And at one point toward the end, initially there is a... The communications officer says, quote, don't touch anything, unquote. And you said something about a knife. And she said, quote, don't touch anything, unquote. And you said, quote, I have already picked it up, unquote. Or, quote, I have already touched it, unquote. Words to that effect? Yes. So I have heard several times. Okay. Now, in another situation in there, Officer Waddell says something about a knife. Yes, sir. Okay. And you made a remark to him? Yes, sir. There is also a, in the conversation there, there is a direction. And of course, you were here when Waddell testified and said he didn't recognize his voice saying to get the rags. Yes, sir. Was that Waddell or was that Darren? No, sir. That was not Waddell. I know my husband's voice. All right. I have listened to that tape many times. Okay. Mr. Mulder says, Judge, what I would like to suggest to the jury is that they listen to the tape with our bold print italicized part first so that you know where our discrepancies are. And then, and the court says, all right, roll the tape then. And then Mr. Mulder says, and then once you have spotted that, I would like to have you play it again so you can hear it again like that. And then I would like to play it again for you a third time where you can just hear our version. And the court says, all right, if you will proceed, please, Mr. Douglas. Mr. Mulder says, yes, sir. All right. This is the right one without the cover sheet on it. Everybody got it? Okay. And the court says, okay. And at this point, the tape is played for the jury. Now, I personally am going to pause here. I am going to insert the 911 call here just as the jury heard it. I'm only going to do it once. I'm not going to do it three times. But if you wish to skip this portion... It runs about five and a half minutes. All right. So, with that said, here is the 911 call. Uh, 911, what is your emergency? Oh, Ma'am? They just stabbed me in my cousin. What? They just stabbed me in my cousin. Who did? Hang on, hang on, hang on. Medical emergency. Hang on, ma'am. Ma'am. I know medical emergency. 5801 Eagle Grove. Ma'am. 
Ma'am, I'm trying to get an ambulance to you. Hang on a minute. Oh, God, my baby's a dying. What's going on, ma'am? <laughs>
And after this call is played for the jury, Mr. Mulder says, Judge, now that they have kind of identified the areas, we would like to play it through one more time like this. And then finally play it through with them not looking at this, both just looking at our version. And so they can check it. And the court says, all right, you may proceed. And Mr. Mulder then says, by now, if you will look at this thing, now that you have identified it, and then we will go through it with ours. And the court says, all right, let's go. And at this point, the tape is again played for the jury, and then everything resumes. And the court says, all right. Mr. Mulder says, judge, now we would like for them to just take our version and listen to it. And that is the one with the cover sheet on it. And the court says, okay, is everybody ready? And Mr. Mulder says, there is a word in there, darling that they say is fighting. And you said, frightened. Frightened? It sounds like, I didn't say fighting. All right, okay. The court says, all right, Mr. Douglas, are you ready? And Mr. Douglas of the defense says, yes, sir. And the court says, all right, crank her up. And again, the tape is played for the jury. So at this point, the court, after all of these recordings are played, they have broken for lunch. They've all now come back into the courtroom, and the court says, All right, are both sides ready to bring the jury back in and continue? Mr. Mulder says, Yes, sir, the defense is ready. Mr. Davis says, Yes, sir, the state is ready. And then once the jury is brought in and seated, Mr. Mulder continues. Darley, I think we were at that point in time where you said that Darren had come back from taking Dana home. Yes, sir, that evening. Yes, yes the evening of the 5th, and he come home. About what time did he get home? I want to say it was sometime after 10 o'clock. Okay, a little bit after 10 o'clock. All right, and tell the jury what happened after he got home. Where you were, where the boys were, what was going on? Well, after we got home, or after Darren got home, Devin was sleeping in front of the TV, directly in front of the TV, Damon was lying beside the couch. He wasn't asleep yet, but he was laying there with his little kitten. I was laying on the couch with Drake on me. Drake was awake. Okay, and Darren came in, and what happened? Darren came in, and after a few minutes, Drake was getting a little bit fussy because he was ready to go to bed. So I made Drake a bottle, and Darren went upstairs. He said something about he was going to watch the news and that he would feed Drake and put him down to sleep. So he took Drake with him when he went upstairs? Yes, sir. He took Drake with him. All right. And after a period of time, did he come back? Yeah, after about 30 minutes. Okay. Did you all continue to talk? Yes, sir. Okay. Had you, did you talk about the trip you were taking? Yeah, we talked about many things. We talked about what was said about the trip to Pennsylvania. Well, just that I had talked to my father earlier, and, you know, they were really looking forward to us coming, and it was my grandparents' 50th anniversary, and when were you due out there? We were to fly in on the 14th of June. Where would you fly? We were to fly into Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and then I had my relatives coming to pick me up in Pittsburgh, it's about a two-and-a-half-hour drive from Pittsburgh to Altoona. Had airplane tickets? Yes, sir. Okay. And for all five of you? Yes. Well, Drake was just an infant that sat on your lap, so you really didn't have to purchase a ticket for Drake. But tickets for the rest of y'all? Yes, sir. We had had tickets for months. When were you coming back from Pennsylvania? I want to say that we were coming back, like, on the 28th, I think because it was a Saturday, because I had a baby shower that I was going to give on Sunday. So you were going to be gone for two weeks or thereabouts? Yes, sir. Okay. What else did y'all talk about? We talked about the business a little bit. We talked about business every day, just basically, you know, what was going on? You know, was it busy? Was it slow? You know, what's going on? That kind of thing. 
Okay. We talked about, okay. Did you still help with the business some? Some, not as much. At that time, Drake was getting around a lot more and Devin was out for school. And so I wanted to be, you know, at home with the boys. Okay. Had you brought any records home from the personal records home from the business? Yes, sir, I had. Tell us about those and where were they in your home? It was around March that I quit working at the shop where I didn't go up there all the time. I would just drop in once in a while, but not on a daily basis. And I just took all of my personal files. I mean, the files that had been mentioned during this trial were my personal files from my office. They were in folders. They had labels on them. It wasn't just papers on the will or papers on insurance or anything like that. Well, had you consulted a lawyer about estate planning? Yes, I had done that. And you saw the letter that was admitted into evidence? Yes, sir. Now, the other things that, I guess, directions as to how you wanted the estate divided up in the event that you died in some common disaster? If Darren and I were to die together is mainly what I was concerned with, because on our insurance policies, I think you become an automatic beneficiary. If your spouse dies, I think it's automatic. You have it written up to where were those directions in with the letter from the lawyer? Yes, sir. There was a lot more papers in with all that stuff than what has been shown. And that had been done some time back? Yes, sir. Okay. Do you remember the green plastic container that was pointed out to the jury as the container in which you kept your sewing equipment? Yes, sir. Did you have any sewing equipment in there? No, sir. What was in that? It was all files inside of that. And is that, were those papers that you brought home from the office? Yes, sir. Personal papers that you had? Yes, sir. Just hadn't found a place for them in the house? No, actually, I had been talking about getting a file cabinet, and I didn't want just a regular plain file cabinet that sat out in the middle of the... I wanted a file cabinet that looked like a piece of furniture. It's harder to find those. You wanted a file cabinet that didn't look like a file cabinet. Well, yes, I guess you could say that. Okay. At any rate, what else did y'all talk about? We talked about the boat. What about the boat? We had not been using the boat very much since Drake was born, and the boat had had a problem, and it was going to cost, I don't know, I think Darren had told me like $800 or something to get it fixed. He had just gotten an estimate from somebody, and we discussed getting rid of the boat because we weren't using it anymore. There wasn't an argument. That's all been taken out of context. There was not an argument about the boat. There was not an argument about the car. What I was upset about was that a man had called me earlier and had pretty much, I mean, he was very rude and had cussed me out over the phone about something that I didn't even know about. My husband's car was at his shop and he wanted my husband to come and pick it up and he was very rude to me and I was upset about it. It wasn't your fault? Well, I didn't even know about it. Okay, did you discuss that? Yeah. And you talked about the boat? Yes, sir. You thought the boat was a headache that y'all didn't need? Yes, and my husband had made plans to put the boat in the boat trader. Matter of fact, I think that he had spoken to somebody about that. All right, but it was just a normal discussion between you and your husband? Yes, sir. Okay, and about what time did you decide you were going to stay downstairs versus going upstairs? I don't really know as far as what time. It was sometime while we were talking. Okay. Did you have a pillow there? No, Darren went upstairs and got me a pillow and a blanket. Is that the maroon pillow that we have seen here? Yes, sir. It's got the squares or diamonds on it, I think. Okay, and he brought that down to you? Yes, sir. Okay, and did you visit some more? Or was that... We were kissing for a little bit. Okay, and then did he go on upstairs? Yes, sir. Okay, and will you tell the jury where you were stationed on that sofa? Was your head toward the TV set or away from it? Well, my head was, like, if I am sitting like I am right now, the TV was behind me. Okay, my head would be right here, and she indicates on a diagram. All right, where would your feet be? My feet would be down here, and again, she indicates on a diagram. 
Okay. You had a blanket? Yes, sir. Okay. What color was the blanket? The blanket was green. Okay. And you had the maroon pillow? Yes, sir. Anything else? As far as what I had? No, as far as pillows or blankets or anything of that nature. There was another gold pillow underneath me. Okay. Anything else? I can tell you what the boys had. All right. Devin had a Power Ranger pillow about right about here, and he had his head here with his legs going towards the TV. Damon was on a gold pillow down here by the couch. His head was on the gold pillow with his feet facing towards the couch, and he had a blue pillow, and he was laying there with his little black kitten. Okay, all right, and Darren went on upstairs to bed? Yes, sir. I asked him if he had made sure that the front door was locked, and he said that he did, and I asked him to turn off the kitchen light as he was going upstairs. Okay. Did y'all set your alarm? No, sir, I wish we had. Okay. We never set our alarm. We had set it a couple of times, and a couple of times that we set it, it went off. And I don't know if it went off because of the cats or what, but it went off, and it was a real big deal. And anyway, we just kind of got out of the habit of not setting it. Okay, all right. So were you still watching TV or what? I watched TV briefly just for a few minutes. Okay, and then curled up with your head toward the TV set and your feet away. I went to sleep. I was tired. Okay, was Devin asleep? Both of the boys were asleep. All right. He was facing toward the TV set? Yes, sir. And the other youngster, Damon, was facing away from it, as were you? Yes, sir. Okay, and did you go to sleep? Yes, sir, I did. All right. Darley, what is the very next thing that you remember, that you either felt or heard or saw? The next thing that I remember is Damon hitting my right shoulder, and he said, Mommy, or he said, Mommy, Mommy, I'm not sure, but he said, Mommy. I looked up, and you've got to remember that I'm in a, I am not completely awake. You know, when you first wake up, you are not completely wide awake. And there was a man that was down, going away from the couches, walking away from me. I started to get up. And when I stood up, I heard noise like glass breaking. I started to walk towards the kitchen. Damon was behind me. And when I got to the kitchen, I put my hand back here for Damon to stay. And when I got to the kitchen, I could see the guy going into the utility room. Were the lights on? No, sir, the lights were off. Okay, so the area was illuminated by the big screen TV set only? There was a little bit of, yeah, I mean, there was a little bit of light. I don't know what you would call that, just kind of a, okay, a glare, maybe? All right, okay, what happened? I started to take a couple of steps into the kitchen. And I realized that the lights were off. So I turned back around and I flipped the lights on real quick. I started to walk into the kitchen. Where was the man by this time? He was gone. He was out of my sight. All right. I got into the kitchen and I got to where the island is. There is an island in the middle of the kitchen. I got to where the island was. And it was at that moment that I realized that I had blood on me. And I kept going, walking a little bit, and I saw a knife laying in the utility room. The knife wasn't completely the whole way in the utility room. It was just like a little bit into the doorway of the utility room. It was an instinct. I picked up the knife. It was an instinct to pick up the knife. I didn't think about it. It was just an instinct. I picked up the knife. I brought the knife back to the kitchen counter and set it up on the kitchen counter. At that time, I started to walk into the living room, and it was at that time that I saw Devin, and he was laying on the floor, and he wasn't moving, and his eyes were open, and he had cuts on him that were so big. Did you say anything at that time? I screamed, Devin. I screamed out, and I couldn't believe what I was saying. It was at that time that I turned back around, and I went to Damon, and Damon was standing up still. Could you see that he had been hurt or cut or anything at that point? Not at that time. I couldn't see that he had been hurt. I just started checking all over him, and when I turned him around, I could see big, huge wounds through his shirt. I started screaming, 
and I ran into the entranceway and I flipped on the lights real quick and I was screaming, Darren, Devin, Darren and Devin. And we ran back into the hallway. Darren went over to Devin. I went into the kitchen and flipped the lights on and I grabbed the phone and I went to the drawer where there's towels in the drawer and I went to the drawer and I went over to the sink and I got the towels wet. Did you have all the lights on now? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. So the area of both the den and the kitchen was fully illuminated? Yes, sir. You went over to the kitchen. You got the phone. And then what did you do? I went to the kitchen and I got the phone. And then I went to the drawer and I got the towels. And then I went to the sink. Okay. Why did you get the towels? I just wanted to help to stop the bleeding. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do. I was just reacting. Okay, so you got the towels. I got the towels and I went to the sink and I got the towels wet. All right, were you on the phone with 911? At that time, at that time, I think 911 came on. Okay, I don't know what I said. I mean, do you know if you started, if you got the towels before you called 911 or you called 911 before you got the towels or did it all happen about the same time? Yeah, I mean, I got the towels and I was calling 911 as I got the towels. All right. And after you got the towels wet, did you take those to Darren? I got a couple of towels wet. I went to Damon first. Okay. I put a towel on Damon's back. There's been a lot of controversy that I didn't do that, but I did do that. I put a towel on my baby's back. You were the only one. The police didn't get any towels out, did they? No, sir, the police did not get any towels out. Darren didn't get any towels out. Darren didn't get any towels out. Darren was trying to save Devin. All right, so you got the towels and you took them to Damon? I put a towel on Damon. Then I told him to hold on. I said, quote, hold on, baby. And he said, quote, okay, mommy. That is the last thing that he said to me. All right, Darlie, just tell us, as best you recall, what happened after that? I went over to Darren, and Darren was down, and he was breathing into Devin's mouth. And I didn't know how to do CPR. I didn't even know what I was doing. When Darren was blowing into Devin's mouth, you could see some blood coming out of his wounds on the side of his chest. All right, what did you do? I didn't know what to do. All I did was just put a towel on it. I didn't know what to do. How did you put the towel down? I just put the towel on top of his chest wound. Okay. After that, I ran back. And I think that is when I ran and I screamed for Karen across the street because I didn't know what to do. And I knew that we had to get help. Karen is the nurse. Karen is the nurse. And she is one of my best friends. And I knew that she would know what to do. Okay. So I called for Karen. Did you get more towels? Did you go back and forth to the sink? Yes, sir. I got more towels. I got another towel. I didn't know what I was doing. I got another towel and I went back to the sink and I got another towel. I put another towel beside Damon and I told him to hang on. He was still alive. He was still trying to breathe. What was Darren doing at this time? Darren was still with Devin. All right. Were y'all frantic? Yes, sir. Very much. Can you imagine your babies are dying in front of you? What do you do? What do you do? Both of you were frantic? Yes, sir. Did you keep talking to 911 or do you know? I don't even remember. There was so much going on at one time. It was crazy. Did the police come? Yes, sir. An officer came. All right. Did Officer Waddell come? Yes, sir. Okay. Officer Waddell came in. I was standing over at the kitchen bar and I was leaning over the vacuum cleaner that was out there earlier because I was a little dizzy and I couldn't breathe very good. That vacuum cleaner right there. Did you know how badly you had been hurt at that time? No, I didn't know. I had seen my neck in the mirror. Where is mirror located? The mirror is located behind the wine rack in the kitchen. Okay, so it's obscured somewhat by the wine glasses and the wine bottles. It's behind the wine rack. Okay, in this area, can you see that? Yeah, that is where it's at. Okay, that is the wine rack? Yes. There is a mirror back here on the wall? Yes, sir. Okay. 
Was Waddell as consumed and taken aback by the horror of the scene as y'all were? Yes, sir. Was he of much help? No, sir. Okay. Did you, you heard this 911 tape 20 times, I bet, haven't you? Yes, I have heard it a lot. Okay. When we tried to figure out what was going on and what was being said and who was saying what? Yes, sir. Okay. And you talk at times to Waddell, do you not? I believe so. Yes, sir. All right. You are carrying on a number of conversations with a number of people. I'm talking to a lot of different people. I didn't even know really what was going on. All right. At any rate, did the paramedics get there? Waddell was in the living room and he told me to sit down or lay down. I don't remember which. And I did that. You had been holding on to the vacuum cleaner. I had just been leaning over it for support just to keep myself up. When I sat down, I kind of took the vacuum cleaner with me. Okay. I don't know which way. I don't know which way. I have no idea. I mean, I don't know. I have heard all kinds of stuff about that. And okay. Did you ever see the vacuum cleaner in the kitchen? No, sir. Was the vacuum cleaner ever in the kitchen at any time? No, sir. The vacuum cleaner was never in the kitchen while I was there. Okay. I know because I ran back and forth through that kitchen. That vacuum cleaner was not in the kitchen at all. Okay. What happened after the paramedics got there, Darley? Sergeant Walling got there. And Sergeant Walling right away was, I mean, he was very, they ran, he said something to Waddell. And Sergeant Walling and Waddell ran through the kitchen and went into the garage. Do you know if they went by the wine rack or if they went by the sink? I think that they went by the wine rack. Okay. I think that they both went through where the wine rack is. Okay. It seemed about, I don't know. At that time, Darren ran out of the room also, not with them, but he ran the other way towards the front door. Okay. How long was it before you were taken to the front porch? I don't know, sir. I mean, when the paramedics came in, one of them went back, one of them went over to Devin, and one of them went to Damon, and he was doing something to Damon, and I saw him put his hands on Damon's neck. Damon had his head away from me, and I asked him, is he dead? And he wouldn't answer me, but when he picked him up and turned him over, his eyes were open, and he wasn't moving. Okay, did they take Devin? Did they take Damon out? Yes, sir, they took Damon out. All right. And moments later, did they take you to the front porch? Yes, sir. But I didn't remember, though. Okay. You don't remember them taking you from the den to the front porch? No, sir. Do you remember them taking you from the front porch to the ambulance? Yes, sir. Okay. Vaguely. Okay. When I was out on the front porch, there were so many people. Do you know how many paramedics came into that room? I have no idea. I know there were a lot of people running in and out of that house. Do you know how many police officers were in there? I have no idea. I know it had to have been at least, I mean, while I was there, it had to have been at least two or three. Okay. Do you know how many paramedics? Could it have been as many as six or seven paramedics? Are you talking about paramedics and the, I'm talking about, and firemen in the house? Yes, there were several. I mean, I don't know the exact number, but there were several. As many as five or six or so? More. Okay. I mean, there was at least five or six. Do you remember them taking you from the front porch to the ambulance? Vaguely. Do you remember Darren helping you on the stretcher? Darren and there was another, I think he was a paramedic. They tried to help me over to the stretcher. And when I stood up, Darren said something to me that my panties were gone. Is that the first that you realized? That is the first that I realized that by panties were even that they were gone. Do you, you were taken on to Baylor Hospital? Yes, sir. And they bandaged your, they bandaged my right arm at the door. I believe the paramedic told me that he was going to bandage it and that it might hurt because he was going to have to put a lot of pressure on it to stop the bleeding. Okay. And they also bandaged my neck at the front door as well. Okay. I don't remember very much because there were so many people. You have got to remember there were, I mean, you kind of have to put yourself in that situation. There were people running in and out and screaming and yelling. It was chaotic. It was very chaotic. And for anybody to sit up here and say that it wasn't, I mean, it was very chaotic. 
You talked to Darren once you were in the ambulance? Yes. Did you know at that time that your sons were both dead? Yes, sir. Did he try to go to the hospital with you in the ambulance? He tried to get into the ambulance. I don't know what they said to him, but I know he did try to get into the ambulance. Okay. You were taken on to the hospital? Yes, sir. It took them a little while to decide where they were going. I remember the one paramedic, there was a bunch of people in there, but the one paramedic was talking back with the paramedic in the front that was driving. And you could hear the, like the radio, I guess, where they were getting their instructions of which hospital to go to. And at first they were saying Baylor or Garland something, Baylor of Garland. And then they said something like, no, Baylor of Dallas. And it was like they couldn't, they were trying to decide which, I guess, which place that they were going to go to. Okay. Were you asked by any of the police officers at the scene as to what does this man look like and how much of him you saw? Yes, sir. I believe that Sergeant Walling asked me at the front door a description of the man. Okay. What did you tell him? I told him that I wasn't sure if he was white or black because it was dark, but that I assumed that he was white because of his hair. What was there about his hair? His hair was longer and it was straight and he had a dark colored cap on his head. Okay. Could you, did you ever see the front of the cap? No, sir. Later they asked me in the hospital if the cap, if the bill of the cap, if I could see it from the back and I told them no that I could not see the bill from the back. Okay, some people wear their hat backwards with the bill around the back. My little boys wear their hats sometimes with the bill around the back. Okay, and you said you didn't see the bill? No, sir. Do you know if the cap even had a bill? Well, I can't say for sure. Okay, what else did you give them? What other description did you give them? I told him that he had on a dark colored t-shirt and that he had on jeans. Okay. Did they ask you about how tall he was or how much he weighed? Not until later. Okay. In the hospital, somebody asked me. I think somebody asked me how tall he was, I think. Okay. Detective Frosch is considerably taller than Detective Patterson? Yeah, he looks like it. All right. And was he built more along the lines of Detective Frosch than Detective Patterson? Yes, sir. Did you tell them that? Yes, sir. All right. Did you, Darley, when Detectives Patterson and Frosch came to see you in the hospital, did you cooperate with them? As much as I could, yes. Did you answer the questions? Yes. Okay. You stayed there in the hospital for three days? Yes. Okay. I was released on Saturday. Okay. Your family came down to visit you? Yes, sir. And your in-laws, Cyrilda and, is it Lenny? Yes. Routier from Lubbock? Yes, sir. And your sisters and your mother and relatives came to see you? I was told a lot of people came to see me. I don't really remember very much of the people actually being in there. But yes, that is what I was told. You saw Drake? He was there? Yes, I do remember Drake. Okay, they brought Drake down a couple times. Did they? Yeah, the time that I really remember being with Drake was Saturday and Karen had brought Drake up to the hospital. And they had taken the last of my tubes out of my arms and Karen put him on my stomach and I fed him a bottle. There was another time before that, but I really don't remember very much about it. Okay. Another time when Karen brought Drake down? Yes, sir. Okay. Darley, you have heard testimony about the bruises to your arms? Yes, sir. Did you realize that your arms had been bruised there in the hospital? I realized a little bit later that they had been bruised in the hospital. I didn't mean when you first got to the hospital. Right. But while you were still there at the hospital? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. And until you heard Dr. Santos and Dr. Dillon and Dr. DeMaio mm -hmm, testify that those bruises were the result of blunt trauma? Yes, sir. I didn't know that that is what they were caused from. Did you realize that you had been beaten? No, sir. I thought that the bruise on my right arm was because of the wound. I had no idea that it was from blunt trauma. Yes, blunt trauma until I heard them talking about it. The bruise on your left arm where you had the medical intervention, the IV and the arterial line. Yes, sir. Did you assume that those had caused the injuries to your... 
I assume that the IV did because I have had IVs before that have done that. I'll ask you, Darley, while you were there at the hospital, if you realized anything unusual about the inside of your mouth. Yes, sir. What was that? My mouth was very sore. It felt kind of raw inside. Do you know what caused that? I don't know what caused it. I can tell you what I, I can speculate. I can tell you what I think caused it. What do you think caused it? I think that the man had his hand over my mouth while he was attacking me. Okay. Do you have any recollection of this man attacking you and beating you severely and cutting you? I don't have any, what you would say that, I mean, that I can remember him doing that. I have assumed that that is what he has done because common sense tells you that that is what he has done. Well, do you have any recollection of fighting with him or struggling with him? No. Okay. Not as far as remembering. You can look at your arms and at your, the bruises and these stab marks. That's all that was ever said. I mean, the bruises and the stab marks would lead you to that inescapable conclusion, would it not? I think it led all of us to that conclusion. Okay, but you have no recollection? No, sir. Okay. I have sat in a jail cell for seven months, and I have tried to think very hard. I have tried to do self-relaxation. I have talked to Lisa about self-relaxation, kind of. Have you had dreams, nightmares? Yes, sir. I have had a lot of dreams. I have had dreams. You and Darren also went to a psychic? Well, we had a psychic come out to the house. Okay. You had a psychic come to your mother's house? We had a psychic come to the house. On Eagle Drive? Yes, sir. And go through the house with you? Yes, sir. It's not something that I really believe in or practice, but I think that when you are a parent and when you are desperate to find answers, that you will do just about anything. What did the psychic tell you? Mr. Toby Shook of the prosecution says, Judge, we will object to hearsay, and the court says sustained. Mr. Mulder continues, did the psychic give you a description of what had Mr. Shook says, Judge, we will object to hearsay. Mr. Mulder says, Judge, I'm not going to go into it, but I'll, Mr. Shook then says, about him going into a description, and we will object to relevance as to what a psychic told them. The court says, well, I'll let you rephrase the question, Mr. Mulder, and before you answer, ma'am, if Mr. Shook wants to make an objection, I'll let him make an objection. So please state your question. Mr. Mulder says, did you all go through the house with a psychic? A little bit. Okay. And did the psychic do whatever psychics do out there? Yes. I guess the psychic went through the house. Yes. Was it a male psychic or actually she says that she is a psychic. Mr. Shook says, Judge, I'll object to the hearsay. The court says, sustained. Let's don't say what anybody else says. The witness, Darley, says, okay, she is a psychic and an investigator. Mr. Mulder continues, okay, not just a psychic. But at any rate, did she give you her impressions of what had gone on in the house? Yes, sir. And the court says, that's all right. Just wait until the next question comes up. And Darley says, okay. Mr. Mulder continues. And have you discussed with your mother and with your husband and with friends what the psychic said? I have discussed it with just about everybody I know. Okay. What the psychic said and my dreams. You were released from the hospital on the 8th. Is that right? Yes, sir. Saturday and went to the viewing where your son's bodies were, it didn't go directly to the viewing. Well, you went from there, didn't you go directly? I went directly from the hospital with the police to the police department, okay? And then from the police department to the viewing, all right? Did the police know that you had a viewing that evening? Yes, sir, okay? And did they tell you that it was necessary for you to come by and make a statement. Yes, sir. They were very adamant about that. All right. Did you and Darren both go by and make a statement to the police? Yes, sir. Okay. Did you cooperate with the police? Very much so. Okay. And after the viewing, the funeral was the next day? Yes, sir. Okay. And Darren had, Darren and his mother had pretty much arranged the funeral, had they not? 
they arranged most of the funeral and they would come back to the hospital and tell me what was going on. All right. Did you know that they were going to have the gangsters? I didn't know until I got there. Okay. But was that, in fact, your boys, one of their favorite songs? Yes, sir. And I think that it's been made way too much of an issue. Children, did the boys understand the lyrics to that song? No, the boys didn't understand the lyrics. They just understand the beat, the rhythm. A lot of children are like that. That is how they teach them in school. I have been around children a lot. I have been a volunteer. And children, communication is taught through music. Mr. Shook says, Judge, we will object to the non-responsiveness of that answer. The court says, overruled, go ahead. Mr. Mulder continues, why did the children like that music? Children liked the music because of the beat and the rhythm. A lot of communication is taught to children through music. Did you boys like music? Very much. I don't know too many children that don't. They danced to the music, would they? Oh, yes. All right. And you would sing to your children, wouldn't you? Yes, sir. Okay. Would you sing to them frequently? Yes, sir. And what would you sing to them? I sang to them all kinds of songs. Okay. Did they have any favorites? They had lots of favorites. I sang Jesus Loves Me to Drake every night. Okay. And that was one of the songs that was played at the funeral, wasn't it? Yes, sir. Okay. Do you recall what the other song was that was played at the funeral? I believe that it was I Will Always Love You by Whitney Houston. All right. Was that one of y'all's favorites? Yes, sir. Okay. After the funeral, there was a, sometime later, there was a graveside service. Yes, sir. Okay. And did that follow the funeral? Well, which one are you talking about? Well, was there a graveside service that immediately followed the funeral? Oh, yes. Yes, there was. And then there was a prayer service some four or five days later on the 14th. Yes. Yes, sir. Following the prayer service there, darling, there was a birthday party. Yes, sir. Or a celebration of sorts. Yes, there was. Were you there for that? Yes, I was. Was that your idea? Well, no, it wasn't. It was my sister's. How did that come about and why? Well, it was Devin's birthday. And for those of you who have children, Devin wanted nothing more than to be seven. Devin asked me day in and day out for two weeks, Mommy, am I seven yet? And I told him, no, not yet, but you will be soon. And it was a way of telling Devin, happy birthday. I didn't see anything wrong with it. We have been criticized and ridiculed. How do you ever know what you are going to do unless you are placed in the same situation? And who has the right to tell you, Mr. Toby Shook says, Judge, I'll object to the narrative non-responsive going into a narrative. The court says, Ma'am, let me just caution you. Just answer the questions as briefly as you can, okay? The witness says, I'm trying to. The court says, I know you are, and you are doing a good job. Thank you. Just try to be very brief. Mr. Mulder continues, Darley, did you love those children? I loved those children more than my life. They were the most important thing to me. And... What they have done is wrong. Did you ever, ever harm those children? Never. Okay. Did you stab those children and then cut yourself? No, I did not stab those children, nor did I try to stab myself. Would you have any reason to do anything like that? No, sir. But to love those children? No, sir. Do you know who did kill your children? No, sir. Mr. Mulder says, we will pass the witness. They will have some questions for you. And the court says, Mr. Shook. And at this point, we're going to pause before we head into the cross-examination by Mr. Toby Shook. And we'll continue that in the next episode. Okay, so let's recap what we've learned. So we started off where we left off in the last episode. The jury had taken a break and the defense had handed out copies of the 911 trans transcript, excuse me, with various differences. Darley is asked when she's on the stand who said to her to, quote, get some rags while she was on the 911 call. And she distinctly said that it was her husband's voice. It was not Officer Waddell's. In Officer Waddell's testimony very early on, he was asked, quote, it's your story here today that you asked her to get a rag. 
is that right? And he responds with, yes, a rag or a towel. I think I asked her to get a towel. Now, at one point when they're just, or they're probably on the third time of listening to the 911 call, the judge, this is just, just my own personal opinion. The judge says, crank her up, you know, as if they're listening to some kind of song, not a freaking 911 call, right? So the jury breaks for lunch. And when the questioning by the defense resumes, we start up at the time that Darren had arrived home after taking Dana home. Now, Darley said that it was around 10 o'clock at night when Darren walked in the door. In Darren's testimony, he said that it was about 10.15. Devin was in front of the TV. Damon was laying next to the couch. Damon was asleep and Devin was not yet asleep. Darley was on the couch with Drake on her. Drake was awake. He started to get fussy, so she made Drake a bottle, and Darren went upstairs with Drake to feed him because he wanted to watch the news. Now, in Darren's testimony, if you recall, he said that he was the one who had made Drake the bottle. He also said that he went upstairs to watch TV for, quote-unquote, a while. Now, Darlie, in her testimony, said that Darren came back down about 30 minutes later, and they talked about the trip to Pennsylvania, that they were taking, uh, they were going to take this on the 14th of June to go to a 50th wedding anniversary. They had had tickets for the trip for months. They were going to be gone for two weeks and then come back just before Darlie was to throw a baby shower for someone. In Darren's testimony, he too said that he came back downstairs after getting Drake to sleep and that they talked about their upcoming trips. Darren, however, did not mention specifically about the boat or the phone call that Darley had received from the shop. Now, in Darley's statement, which was, this was her statement that she had given June 8th, I believe. In Darley's statement, this was actually read by Detective Patterson in his testimony. And it states that she had told Darren during this conversation that she had been feeling depressed due to not being able to take the boys anywhere because they only had one car. Darley had been working at the business um, at Tesnek off and on, but not as much as before because she wanted to be home with the kids. She had brought some records home from the business and the files and the records that were shown in court were hers from the office. She did say that she had talked with an estate attorney. This is not unusual. And these files were specifically mentioned uh, during the prosecution's portion of the trial. And they were mentioned in Officer David Maine's testimony. Now, that evening, Darley and Darren also talked about getting rid of the boat and Darren's car. They talked about Darren's car that was still in the shop. Darley is adamant that they did not argue about these things. She was upset because of the guy who had called from the garage where Darren's car was and had cussed her out because he wanted Darren to come pick up his car. Darley doesn't recall what time she made the decision to stay downstairs, but that Darren had gone up and gotten her a pillow and a blanket. Now, the pillow was the maroon pillow that had the gold trim. She also had a gold pillow underneath her. In Darren's testimony, whether this is nitpicky or not, he said that Darley had asked him to go get her a pillow and a blanket. Before Darren went upstairs, she had asked him if the front door was locked, and he said that he locked it. She then asked Darren to turn off the kitchen light, and he did that as well. They did not set the alarm. I know that this was brought up in Darren's testimony. They never did set the alarm on the house after evidently a few false alarms that they believe the animals had set off. The next thing that Darley said she remembers is Damon hitting her right shoulder saying, Mommy, and her opening her eyes and seeing a man walk away from her. Now, regarding this Damon saying, Mommy, this has been recounted by not only Barbara Jovell or Baja, who testified for the prosecution, but it's also been recounted by Darren, by Karen Neal, the neighbor across the street, and Dr. Lisa Clayton, the psychologist who spoke with Darley. As a matter of fact, Barbara's testimony so far 
is the only one that doesn't exactly coincide with the others. So let me explain that. In Barbara's testimony, again, she testified for the prosecution. She said that Darley had told her that Darley had felt pressure on her legs and saw a man coming down towards her with a knife. However, we also know that this was a dream that Darley had, and Darley was never sure if it was real or not. And at least this is what I have gathered so far. Darley, in her written statement, talks about a man walking away from her towards the utility room. Karen Neal, Julie Clark, and even Barbara Jovell all testified to the same information that Darley told them. Darley said she heard a noise like glass breaking and she began to walk towards the kitchen. She saw the guy going into the utility room. No lights were on, just the illumination from the television. And as far as the glass breaking goes, Darren actually said that he awoke to the sound first and then he heard Darley screaming. And again, this is just my opinion, but he's all the way upstairs. I honestly don't know how he could have heard that. That, is, again, is just my opinion. And if we're talking about the same thing, the single wine glass that was broken on the kitchen floor, I mean, I would think that it would have to be incredibly loud. Don't you? I mean, this is just, again, my opinion. So after this glass breaking, Darley then took a couple of steps into the kitchen, turned around, turned the lights on in the kitchen. And in her written statement, she said that she got into the kitchen and turned around and turned on the light and then ran towards the utility room where she then saw a knife on a floor on the floor. This is when she realized that she had blood all over her. Now, this was in her statement. Now, in this testimony, she said that she had noticed it in the mirror behind the wine rack. So just wanted to put that out there, those two different discrepancies. Now, the man at this point was gone. Uh, so Darley had actually gotten to the point where the island in the kitchen was, and this is when she noticed that knife in the utility room. Uh, but she said that the knife wasn't all the way into the utility room. It was just a little bit into the doorway, and just out of instinct, she picked up the knife, which she then set on the kitchen counter. She then walked into the living room and saw Devin, and this is when she screamed his name. She then turned around. She saw Damon who was still standing, standing there. She turned him around and saw that he was hurt. And again, she screamed and she ran into the entranceway and she turned on the lights and then screamed Darren and Devin. She kept screaming those names over and over. Now, Darren, in his testimony, if you recall, said that all that she was screaming was Devin, 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 not Darren and Devin. So I don't know if this is a discrepancy in the testimony between the two or if it's just something that was wrong in the transcripts. Now, in Darley's testimony, after she hollered for Darren, she doesn't mention when he came downstairs, just that, quote, we ran back into the hallway and Darren ran over to Devin. She then said that she went into the kitchen and turned the lights on. And I'm assuming that these were different lights or more lights uh, and then went and grabbed some towels, got them wet. And she personally, she didn't say that she went and grabbed the phone to call 911. Uh, I mean, I think we're just all assuming that because obviously she was on the phone with 911. But instead, what the defense attorney does is he interrupts her and he says, quote, you went over to the kitchen and got the phone. And then what did you do? I really wish he would have just let Darlie answer that on her own about the phone instead of telling her essentially what she was going to say next. She did then say that she went and got the phone, but we don't know where the phone was at this point. It was a cordless phone, so it literally could have been anywhere. She believes that, Darley believes that 911 answered while she was at the sink and after she had gotten the towels. She put a towel on Damon's back first, and told him to hold on, and she said he responded to her. She went to Darren, and at this point, Darren is doing CPR, and as he blew into his son's chest, she noticed, Darley noticed blood coming out of his wounds as he blew. 
She also said that she put a towel down on top of his chest wound. And that is when she ran to the front door and screamed for Karen. And we can hear this on the 911 call at two minutes and 32 seconds. So if she just came from laying a towel on Devin and Darren was doing CPR, then we should be able to hear that maybe on the call, right? I'm not, I went back and I've listened. I couldn't pick it up, but you know, I'm, I'm just using my ears and the, and the only 911 call that I have available to me. But remember too, that in Darren's testimony, he told us that Darley was helping him to hold together a chest wound on Damon as Darren performed CPR. So, you know, when did this happen? Did it happen? So after yelling for Karen, she said that she went back to the sink and got another towel. Now, she doesn't say if she wet that towel, just that she went to the sink and got a towel. I know that there's a lot of people that would assume that we should hear water running in the 911 call when she did this. But remember, she didn't say that she went over to the sink to wet the towel, only that she went to the sink to get a towel. And this is the second time towards the sink that she goes to the sink. She said she can't remember if she was still on the phone with 911 after she came back in after hollering for Karen, but then said that Officer Waddell came to the house. But we know that Waddell was there while she was still on the phone with 911 because we have him on the 911 recording. Now, according to Darley, she was standing near the kitchen bar. This is the counter that separates the kitchen from the the room where everybody was. And at this point, she was leaning over the vacuum cleaner because she was dizzy and she found it hard to breathe. She also said that Waddell was in the living room and told her to either sit down or lay down. So she did. And this also is on the 911 call. She had been leaning over the vacuum for support. And when she sat down, she took the vacuum cleaner with her, which would mean that the vacuum cleaner was near the sliding glass doors. At least that's what I'm picturing. She was adamant, Darley was 100% that that vacuum cleaner was never in the kitchen. Now, after Sergeant Walling got there, he was the uh, second officer to show up. He and Waddell ran through the kitchen into the garage and went by the wine rack on the way. Darren then ran not with the officers, but out the front door. When Darley was taken to the stretcher, um, after the ambulances had gotten there, she was taken out, put on the stretcher. She was helped by Darren. Darren was the one to mention to her that her panties were gone. She said that at the time that she entered the ambulance, she knew that both of her children were dead. However, I believe a paramedic had said that Damon still had a faint pulse, which is why they took him. And I believe that he passed while they were on the way to the hospital. Now, she might have believed that he had already passed because of what she saw as the paramedic picked up Devin and was taking him out of the house. But the paramedic never told her how he was doing when she was asked or when she asked him. Darley also said that she believes that Sergeant Walling, the second officer on the scene, asked her for a description of the man that she saw. And she does remember the dark colored hat but couldn't see what was on the front of the hat. She did see his hair from beneath the cap. And I was really curious if they were going to ask what color of hair, but that was never addressed, at least in this portion of the testimony. She also said that the intruder had on a dark colored t-shirt and jeans, and she described later to the police that the man was about the size of Detective Frosch. We first hear about how when Darley was in the hospital, about how the inside of her mouth felt raw while she was there. Now, I don't recall anyone ever testify, testifying about this, at least any doctors or nurses, etc. I did go by and or go through and do kind of a really quick check of some of the testimony, and I couldn't find anything up to this point that talks about her having any issues with her mouth. We learn that Darren and Darley had consulted a psychic because they wanted to find out who this person was. You know, nobody was giving them any leads or anything like that. 
who actually walked through the house on Eagle Drive. But this constantly gets objected to, so we never really get to hear whatever this psychic investigator had told the routiers. So let's move on to the day of the viewing. Darley says that on this day, her and Darren went directly from the hospital to the police station because the police were, quote unquote, adamant that they do so. And we know by this point that the routiers, Darren and Darley, they were considerably late to the viewing because of this stop at the police station. And the police knew that this was the day that they were to have the viewing. So when it comes to the funeral and the birthday celebration, the silly string video that we've all seen, we also learn that it was Darren and his mom who had planned the funeral. So they were the ones that went through and picked out some of these songs. They did evidently run it by Darley, but, you know, they were the ones and here, you know, the prosecution is making it out to be like, well, you know, Darley, you, you chose the song. This is terrible. I mean, seriously, it's, I am so sick and tired of hearing about this song. It is just so petty, you know? So anyway, um, that's where we end for this episode for Darley number two. Next up, we have the prosecution begin to question Darley, and that will be in the next episode. Thank you all. Thank you all so much for listening. Please take a moment to subscribe to the channel, no matter where you listen. Also, please be sure to check out the new Beach House 34 merch shop at Beach House 34, and that's the number 34 dot shop. Thanks again, everyone. We'll talk really soon. Bye for now.